Hey guys, welcome to another episode of Bobby Blockchains. Uh, right now we are continuing the discussion of SegWit, in particular how it addresses transaction malleability. Um, and you know, why is transaction malleability important? For a couple of reasons. One, it's, it's an attack vector, and you can get people to double spend coins. Uh, it was supposedly involved in the Mount Gox meltdown, and, um, and because we can address it now with, with SegWit, uh, it actually enables the Lightning Network, which should give us massive gains in scalability. So I'm going to share my screen with you and kind of go into what it is and how it works. And go. Cool. So typically in a transaction, you've got your transaction ID, which incorporates your signature data. And if you want to use transaction malleability, one of the things you can do because the transaction ID will change if you change the signatures even the tiniest bit. So here's a, um, the unlocking code has changed slightly, but the code still unlocks the input. I mean, I guess it, <laughs> what you're doing is, is you're changing the signature as a string without changing its meaning. I mean, imagine like the number one versus 1 1.00. They mean the same thing, but if you were to go and put one and 1 1.00 through a hash algorithm, you get totally different hash. And, and that's what happens with the transaction malleability attack. Um, you can actually go and I'll, I'll get to this slide in a second. First, how does SegWit address this? We actually just take the witness data and move it outside of the transaction ID entirely. So you've got, um, even if somebody was to go and change the signature data, the transaction ID doesn't change at all because the from address, the to address, the amounts, like none of that stuff changes. And so the, the ID that gets broadcast is the same. And that's what your wallets care about. You know, you want to send money to this address, you broadcast that transaction, your wallet's going to check that transaction ID to see if it got broadcast, if it got done. And um, that's one of the benefits of SegWit is, is not having to deal with that anymore. You can trust the transaction ID without waiting X amount of confirmations to be like, okay, nobody messed with this. Um, so here again, like I was talking about with like the one equaling 1 1.00, in the transaction ID, in the, in, the, in the signature, you could change a couple of the characters and one of them would basically say, hey, the next couple of characters are gonna be in this format. And if you change that to say, are they gonna be in this other format? You know, with like a couple of leading zeros or something. Well then, the meaning of that signature is the same. It's still a valid signature for this transaction. And you haven't changed the, uh, the amounts, you haven't changed the addresses, everything still checks out. But the string that represents it, these characters are slightly different. And because of that, the whole transaction ID is going to be forked. And so what you can do, how does this end up causing somebody to do a double pay? Uh, I'm Bob. Alice is supposed to pay me one Bitcoin. I get the transaction data and I change the signature by doing that move. And I broadcast my transaction ID and hope that it gets taken before hers does. Now if that happens, because they're both the same transaction with slight adjustment, if mine gets taken, hers is gonna fail. And so her wallet's gonna go, oh no, the transaction failed, do you wanna retry? And then she's like, yeah, sure, send another one. So because mine actually ended up going through, I got one of her Bitcoins, it's in my wallet. And then she goes and says, okay, send a new transaction. She's gonna send another coin to my address. So now I'm like, sweet, thanks, bye. And, and that's, that's an issue. Um, and I guess people were also doing this to exchanges. They'd say, oh, yeah, I was supposed to withdraw this money, but uh, it says transaction failed. Could you just send it again? And, and the, the uh, the exchange is like, yeah, yeah, sure. And then they end up losing a bunch of money to this transaction malleability attack. Um, and this is just a little, like, what does it kind of look like? We keep the, we keep the signature field because it needs to be backwards compatible. But in a SegWit transaction, that signature data is empty. And so another benefit of that is that you get to save a ton of space. It's like 50% space savings by doing this. You can put more transactions in per block uh, when you put the witness data somewhere else. And 
think that I had a couple of pictures here. And this visualizes the savings of space. And this is kind of where all of that data goes. So uh, like as a full node, I have a block, got the Merkle root for all of the, all of the transaction data. So transaction one and two and three and four. All of that witness data, the signatures, has its own Merkle tree. It's separate. And they just kind of tack it on transaction one. And uh, so the people who are pre-segwit aren't going to see any of the witness data. They're just going to have a whole bunch of transactions here. Um, and, and the nodes that are actually full nodes that are segwit enabled will have all of this data, whether they choose to keep it or what they do with it. Uh, haven't gotten that far yet. So, so I hope this helps to understand uh, what transaction malleability is, how segwit addresses it, and um, yeah, in the next video, I'll go a little bit further into things like, you know, what is a hash and what is a Merkle tree? How do those things work? Uh, I'll go pretty deep into the details without getting into raw transaction stuff. So, uh, and I'll keep links in the, in the description so you can read up more and watch other videos that I thought were helpful. Um, stop sharing and you guys have a good night. Thanks. Bye.